Welcome to episode 3 of season 2 of the Ubuntu UK podcast. It's Monday the 27th of April and I'm Davey. With me this week are... Tony. Hi Dave, how are you doing? Not too bad. What have you been up to this week? Um, <laughs> that was unexpected, that was rather, that was rather <laughs> unexpected. Excellent. That was rather unexpected. We'll come to that. Oh, okay. Alan. Hello. <laughs> Hello, Tony, what have you been up to this week? <laughs> I was going to ask you that. <laughs> what have you been up to this week? Uh, I, I, I've done, all right, I've done some um, packaging. Oh, yeah? Yeah, we'll probably talk about that more another time, but how, yeah. How is your packaging? Uh, it's hard, actually. It's not as easy as you would have thought. Ah, uh, you're worse. Yes. And Simon, hello. Hello. You've finished, have you all? Yeah, yeah, it's okay, fine, thanks. Fine. <laughs> and what? we've also got in the studio our lovely producer, Laura. Hello, Laura. Hiya. What have you been up to this week, Simon? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've been playing with Jordy in its, uh, in its various forms. I've downloaded the disc and uh, done a... A clean install, and I've been playing with the netbook edition, which I don't like. Did you so, jump on the uh, download it as soon as it's out? Or mm, no, I did jump in and say, <laughs> in fact, it was too is it out, yeah. out yet? Yeah, and I'd, I'd see the email. Somehow, I can imagine up. Simon sitting there hammering F5, no, refresh, <laughs> waiting no, for it to appear. No, 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 no. You're not using CrunchBang then? Yeah, I am. But I installed the new Jaunty uh, oh, with okay. GNOME on a cool. spare box. And uh, the netbook... Had a play on the 700, 701 on the EPC, and um, yeah, delete. Back to crunch bang. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we've covered what we've all been doing this week. Um, so what's in the show? Uh, we have a thing called Chip Off the Old Bloke. Of the old bloke. Bloke. <laughs> Actually, I think that should be chip off the old block. Uh-huh. Popey from the block. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to talk about the big release that has been jaunty. What's that then? We'll find out. Yeah, we'll talk about news and events as we always do. Um, community clash. Yeah, talking mm. about the mm. stress in the community. Um, we've got the results of the competition. Uh, hang on, didn't we have the results of the competition last time? I yeah. Re- yeah, I think we I did. I didn't remember we? editing that. Yeah. Yeah. I remember recording that bit. Yeah, I put my hands up to hang saying, on, "Hang on, it was in the release notes as well." <laughs> it was in the release notes. Uh, I put my hands up to saying that I forgot to put the competition result audio in the last show but then i would also like to point out that everybody in this room listened to the episode before release and still failed to spot that it wasn't in the show well i blame the qa team to be honest yeah we're we're, we're just the audio let's blame blame schwack he's not here yes (laughs) um Uh, we've got the latest from the ubuntu ecosphere seriously do we have to keep that name ecosphere suggestions um to podcast at ubuntu-uk.org please yeah and we have your feedback Along with Jaunty coming out, there's um, lots of other derivatives coming Sorry. out as well. What is a derivative? Perhaps the best thing to do would be to give some examples, like Kubuntu, which is the KDE-based derivative. Yes, of or Zubuntu, the XFCE one, or Crunchbang. All right, is that, see, that's a different kettle of fish, because we've got official ones and we've got unofficial ones. Now, um, I mean, another one is Mythbuntu. Yep. Um, I don't know if that's very popular though. No, no, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Do some, do some Google Trends. Development. Ubuntu Studio. Yeah. Yep. Um, Mint. Ah, see, oh, see, see. There we go. Because Mint and Crunchbang are probably in the same boat, aren't they? In are what they, way? As in they're not official. Going on holiday. Well, what's official got to do with it? Yeah. What's, well, um, what's a derivative. Uh, official. Well, aren't not? they all the derivatives of Debian then? Are you Ubuntu. Yeah, in a way, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, so we were thinking. Well, those are the. The current derivatives that are out there but you know what derivatives would you like to see or we like to see and um, producer laura's put it on twitter and identica and we've got some suggestions and things coming from the great and the good community and of uupc listeners um what ideas and suggestions have we had then chaps <laughs> oh that would mean uh, switching on my laptop and right uh, to- asterisk buntu is a possibility comes pre-configured to um basically get your SIP phone going? Yeah. That's a possibility? That's, that You'd like, like that? Yeah, I would. Yeah. Uh, just because it looks like a lot of <laughs> <laughs> effort. <laughs> well, but the thing is, that would be a world of headache in itself because there's so many different ways of setting up an asterisk setup. Yeah, it but would... that's, that's no different to Mythbuntu, though. No, no. Um, it, it is. I mean, there, there, there are um, already some derivatives, uh, some asterisk pre, pre uh, right. setup CDs. Like there's PBX and Flash, which is based off CentOS. And there's also Trixbox, and this is where we'd normally insert the audio snare, uh, but that's another one as well. <laughs> Are they a bit like sort of IP copies to firewalls? Yeah, yeah. So you've got yeah. a nice web GUI to do the administration, and it all happens under the surface. Yeah, yeah. So there's clearly a requirement for that kind mm. of thing, then, for that, yeah. spe- that specific one, asterisk. Yeah, yeah that'd be good. And, and on Ubuntu, any reason why not 
given there's well, one on CentOS? Well, the thing is, some of the stuff that goes in it isn't um, packaged to set up terribly well. Uh, like one of the uh, GUIs for actually using it isn't, there's not very good packages for that. I did talk with someone else about actually setting it up last year. And it is on the to-do list. But, but it, that's in, again, that's in the same boat as Mythbuntu. When you started looking at Mythbuntu, surely some of the Myth packages weren't perfect in Ubuntu. And that's why one of the reasons why you would have done Mythbuntu, surely. Um, well, no. If you, uh, I mean, the thing is, you can get exactly the same uh, result using a Ubuntu install and a Mythbuntu install. And it's exactly the same development team behind Mythbuntu as it is the MythTB packages on Ubuntu. So the packages yeah, were pretty good to now? start with. What now? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, and then the packages were pretty good to start with, to be honest. So uh, okay, okay. One of the other suggestions was podcast Ubuntu or podcast Ubuntu, which comes with the necessary stuff for recording and editing audio, a bit like Ubuntu Studio, but a bit less heavyweight because Ubuntu Studio is like a billion megabyte download DVD thing. Isn't See, it? yeah. Now, can you imagine the effort to set that? That's huge for, for such a what? small well to set up a whole distribution for podcasting. Well no, you, if you look at um if you go into PC World, you'll find there's um like podcasting in a box things, which is like a cheap rubbish microphone and a CD that contains audacity. But you could equally package together a microphone and um a live CD or a, a USB stick that's got Ubuntu and the necessary audio stuff. So yeah, okay, that could end up being Audacity or Ardor or or whatever else, hmm. but it would be a nice way for us to get um, the podcasting community, which you know we are part of, and there are quite a lot of other podcasters out there. Particularly, if it, particularly if it came with some sort of tools for doing the hosting and things as well, so yeah. integrated into the various well, maybe services. That, that could be there. part of the package. You know, if you pay fifty quid, you get the microphone, the CD, plus you get a year's worth of hosting of up to one meg a week or something like that. You know, Crikey, you're letting out all your marketing secrets. I know. <laughs> Right, don't edit, can you edit this out? Yeah, we'll, <laughs> oh no, we're doing it live now. We'll we? put it out. Yeah. We'll put it alongside the competition result from the last episode. <laughs> <laughs> what um, else we got? Now uh, the thing is, I I can't help but thinking that a lot of these things does it really need a whole separate distribution on a separate disc? I mean, wouldn't it be nicer just to have like an extra advanced option on the installer? I mean, as it is, a lot of the things are quite well split up. Like got Ubuntu Desktop and Kubuntu Desktop, which are meta packages, and you can just install that on. So you can install. Um, KDE and Kubuntu on Ubuntu system by installing one package. So you're saying that there shouldn't be a separate KD, a Kubuntu CD and a, sh- a separate Zubuntu CD. It should be um, like a, Everything. A, a base CD. Yeah. And then you, you add the extra bits you need for yeah. I whichever mean, there, package there, There's no way it'd fit on one CD. But I mean, no. we've got to start thinking about DVDs soon, haven't we, really, you know? Well, we do. We have DVD oh, images yeah, yeah, all yeah. of them. But I mean, who actually... I mean, have you ever burnt a, um, a Ubuntu DVD ISO? No. Yeah, nor have I. Nah. Yeah. So, but we've got to start thinking about that soon because we're trying to squeeze more and more into such a small area now. It's really trying mm. to cram it in. Yeah. Okay. What have people been saying on the Twitter and the Identica? Um, what about uh, Limey Buntu uh, with metric conversion tools in the root window? <laughs> right. <laughs> Thanks, Lopter. Is that for those people around the world who don't do metric? Yeah, I suppose so. Um, there's how about Ubuntu Twitter edition where all the programs can use a maximum of 140 characters. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Okay. That sounds good. Similarly, uh, text Ubuntu where everything is translated into text speak. Oh my God. Which would be very annoying. And, oh. uh, Phil Wyatt is a little bit embarrassed that he thought of that. <laughs> well, a- well, actually, um, that's something that, um, Scott, um, Scott James Ramnick come up with, uh, at one of the UDSs was actually having a translation of, of pirate. So, People could, tre- could test translations in their applications by using this language file where it's basically based on pirate speak. So it would say, Arr! and I think that's quite uh, a neat idea. So, sorry, Dave, what would it say? Arr! Okay, just checking. <laughs> okay, moving on. Uh, um, Ubuntu Boink uh, from Dave1022 on the Twitter. Is, is that, um, you know, code of conduct friendly? Yes, <laughs> Boink is um, it's a dedicated distro that runs a Boink without any GUI and a super efficient kernel. So Boink is the distributed computing thing for yeah. doing protein folding and loads of other stuff, prime calculation and all mm. that malarkey. But I don't know, is that still popular these days? Is that still it's not very green, is it? Politically correct to be chewing up CPUs mm. at maximum, you know, warp. And making yeah, your house I mean, hot. I mean, finding a cure for cancer, that is, you know, it's more important that we're green to the planet rather than find a cure for cancer. Yeah, but you can probably get more cycles out of a dedicated data center and, you know, a tuned server yeah. than you and can who, out and of who's my old laptop. That? Yeah, but who's paying for that? The mm. planet. 
<laughs> oh. Man, it's not start. Oh, take that Ippies. bandana off. <laughs> Um, Matt Daubney has suggested a paranoid live CD with full security settings and really depressive theme and error messages. <laughs> Hang on, according yeah, to someone recently, aren't we already doing that in Jaunty? Like, hey. <laughs> Joke.popey.com. Uh, and uh, I had some ideas of myself, which I might as well share wow. with you. Um, ooh, ooh. Pub Bun 2, which doesn't let you use it after three drinks. Uh, so it's got a, a breath like the, test. Like the Google. Um, yep. Uh, thing that stops you sending mail after 10 o'clock or whatever. <laughs> yep. Um, Grub Buntu, which has integrated reminders of meal term times. Ah, yeah. Yeah, you could do that with a package, really. Actually, that's a good idea. Eat now. Yeah. Oh, we should have Twitter Buntu, where it helps you twit. Which is, which is one of the suggestions about three minutes ago. <laughs> yep. Welcome <laughs> to the show, Dan, mate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, thanks for your thoughts, everybody. And uh, I think we've got some really good ideas from some distros, and we're all going to go away and make them. <laughs> You two were partying last week, weren't you? In town. Tell us about it. Were we? Yes. Where, where you we don't go? remember. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it was that good. Release party for Jaunty then. Yes. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Thursday. Waxy Thursday O'Connor's? Yeah. No. No, it was uh, the last that one. That was the last one, yeah. yeah. This was... Um, oh, my God. I can't even remember where it was. It was the place with expensive drinks. God, they were expensive. It was like £3.60 for like a normal bottle of... A um, tiny bottle of beer. Tiny, tiny bottle. Yeah, it was a bit of a rip off. That's that's the downside. The upside is there were loads of people there. It was like hundred and something, hundred and eighty. Wow, yeah, probably about that. Yeah, yeah. It was always nice to see the usual faces, and there were some new faces as well. And then when you, when you speak to some people and you've known them for I don't know uh, two or three years, and then suddenly you realise who they are, and the penny drops. <laughs> <laughs> that's quite a moment as well. I won't so. ask who that was. That yeah, there was there. a few people who turned up, like people who sit around in the Ubuntu hyphen UK IRC channel. And um, they turned up and came over and introduced themselves and said hello. And it was really good. They've never been to a party before. and or In, that, in their re- lives. <laughs> well, in some cases, maybe, <laughs> yes. But yeah, they've not been to a release party before. But it was good. It was nice to see. So the users as well, as well as some developers and, um, you know, all the well-known people. Yeah, there was canonical people there, non-canonical people, like other Linux people like Matt Garrett, who works for Red Hat now. Yeah. He was there and, like, I'm not going to name drop loads of people. But there, there were lots of canonical people there and developers and... And us as well. Cool. Okay. So now that it's out, should we be advising everybody to upgrade to Jaunty? I don't know. Should you ever advise people to upgrade? Well, if people are quite happily running Hardy still from a year ago now, then or, I would say... Or an LTS release. That's what I was going to say. It's oh, right. Yeah, yeah, from a year ago. Then I would say, then if they're happy with that, stick with that. But, you know, if they want newer stuff... I mean, there are, there are some nice bells and whistles, aren't there? And if they know that something's fixed in the kernel that's in yeah this release then yeah but i don't know there's nothing that really is are the the notification stuff people uh quite like notification stuff <laughs> and and some others quite hate it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it's it's tricky because it's not it's not a it's not a major you know loads of new Ooh, stuff in it the boot speed though Man, yeah that's true noticed the difference but that we talked about last week like whether yeah. whether you're whether you're going to be interested in so for the average joe who's got a desktop in their room and it's, it's there most of the day sort of doing nothing more than a bit of browsing, a bit of surfing, a bit of this, bit and that. Probably there's no real need to, is there? Well, either way. Oh, well, EXT4 is, is well, supported. Well, EXT4 average is, is yeah, but supported average Joe, like Hardy. What, what the hell is EXT4? It's, um, yeah, I know. But what I'm saying is it doesn't really matter, does it? It's the thing that goes on behind the GUI and the air Well, no, but it's it's a new thing that, that makes your machine potentially faster. But it's been there since about Hardy or so. So Has it? Not it in the has. installer, it hasn't. Uh, you could do it in a bit tricky way, but yeah. No, not in the installer. But it wasn't an option to go the EXT4. Yeah. So, yeah, there's a few things. So what is there? Boot speed, the new notifications, EXT4, a few updates to apps. I think the thing, the thing is, the question for me is, should we be encouraging people to use what are essentially development releases, like in between LTS ones, that, and they're tagged as development releases? I think that's it. arguable, No, they're honest. bug fix releases. It's, well, it says there's a new release and uh, in the upgrade manager says there's a new development release available. It may say I-04. that it will say that before the release, yeah. Yeah. But also it doesn't come up to that to a normal person either. That will only come up if you open it using a, a particular Minus switch. D. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it says distribution release. I yeah. ah, see, can you see yeah. the difference though? It's, it's subtle difference. Yeah, yeah, it's a subtle it, difference. it means almost the same thing, but But yeah, I mean, you know, development release, distribution release, the the point is, it's not a long-term support release. It's 
there's new things in there. There may be a bit of breakage. Should we be telling people to wait a month or two before downloading it if they're not geeky technical well, there users? Was, there was one guy who um, who posted on one of the lug lists this week saying that he he was disappointed because he upgraded his mail server the night Ubuntu Jaunty came out, 904 came out. He upgraded his mail server and it broke his mail server. And he was really annoyed and he thought it should work on day one, which arguably, you know, it should work well, on day one. Uh, you know. if, if we contrast here and say, well, with Windows, would you wait till Service Pack 1 comes out? Or would you use, yes. would you use it when it first yeah. comes out? Well, the same with anything. Uh, you know, with any application, it depends on what you're what you're like, whether you're the kind of person who goes for the very latest crack straight away or whether you wait for a month or you wait or you stay one release behind or six months behind or something. I don't know. Each each to their own. You know, if you're that kind of person, then go for it. Well, something as important as a mail server, I definitely wouldn't. Well, like yeah. It. I might you test kind it out on a development. Want to run an LTS. Or something like that, but wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Unless there was some killer feature in the newer release that you desperately need, yeah, sure. then stick with an LTS for servers. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the mail stack on uh, Jaunty is quite sweet. It's, um, it does a lot more for you setting up uh, for such as spam filtering and, um, and doing IMAP integration as well. It does a lot more out of the box than any other release did. But that's probably going to be more useful for people who've got an unconfigured box. Fresh install, yeah, yeah, fresh, fresh install. install. Yeah, definitely. Whereas someone who's upgrading an existing box, is there anything in the new server other than stuff like the no, server no, because the I mean screen profiles yeah I mean security patches should always go back and screen profiles you know there is a PPA to run that although it's better in jaunty but. yeah so are we a bit meh, about the new release well, not so much the features but just the whole the whole kind of process I mean development releases are, are an opportunity for us you know as a community to have to sort of have a bit of a party and to say what you know, look at what we've achieved in this release cycle but you know should they mean that much to people outside of the development community and the immediate sort of Ubuntu fanboy community. Have, have we become jaded because it's every six months and this is the 10th one? Is it 10th? Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, 10th one. I mean, I'm always really late upgrading because I don't like my applications to break and particularly when I try to do things like a podcast every couple of weeks. If you upgrade at the wrong time and it breaks, then, you know, people get yeah, across. especially if stuff like your audio stack breaks, which is, you know, quite critical to a lot of people. They can't, you know, watch movies, listen to music and you know, the kind of stuff that your average Joe does. But that sort of stuff arguably should get better with each release. But we've seen historically it doesn't. Sometimes mm. it gets worse. Yeah. So I'm always a little bit reticent to always to, to sort of make that commitment and upgrade. So is that why you wait maybe a month or two to see what the lay of the land is, see what other people have expected, let everybody else have the pain and I, you, I you guess catch so. up after? I mean, there's, there was a bug with um, Arda in the... In, Intrepid in the current, well, not the current release. The release has just stopped being current. Where you couldn't import audio. That's not a and bug. That, that's a feature. <laughs> well, that that remained unfixed for the whole of Intrepid, and it was quite a major bug and has caused me some headaches. And that's one of the reasons that I kind of always a little bit nervous about doing mm. upgrading and and try to look for critical bugs on Launchpad for packages that I'm really interested in. And you know, uh, yes, there's one argument that you say you should be running development box and then you can support, report these bugs before the thing's out, but. No, no, I can't run two boxes. Yeah. Now, of yeah. course, what we should see in Carmack is possibly the ability to roll back so you can do a test update yeah. and oh. see what you think of it. And if that you think, cool. oh, I'm not so sure in about In fact, this, you, you know what? Back. We talked about that in like episode three. I think one of us said that we really wanted a way to do upgrades that were completely rollbackable. Season one, episode yes. three. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, people were just leeching our ideas. Yeah. <laughs> we see the future. Some people have been tweeting and denting. Um, Colin McCarthy says he's very happy with 904 on the desktop, although indexing appears to have an issue. Um, he's going to reformat it anyway for EXT4. Um, and his netbook remix is sluggish on his EPC701. Hang on. You, you don't actually need to reformat BXT4, do yeah. you? You can just mount it, and then it will... It, I mean, it's based on the same thing. You can just mount it, and then you can't go back to it, but you can... Just, yes, you can. You can go backwards. Oh, yeah. backwards you, can yeah. go, you can go up to EXT4... And you can go backwards to ext3. Yeah. You just lose the ext4 features when yes. you go back. Well, yeah, I guess you can go back to ext2 still. You just yeah. lose yeah. the journal, yeah. yeah. So, but yeah, um, netbook remix you know, being sluggish on his EPC. Well, I only played it on. Uh, I only used it on my USB stick. I didn't actually install it, and it was a bit sluggish. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't like the GUI either. It just, yeah. Is that I mean, the one with the like fully maximized everything? I, I get confused with much, these mobile yeah. versions, but it's definitely um, aimed at something with a touch screen right. it would be useful for that but um i like my desktop mm. yeah. I, I use easy peasy which is essentially netbook remix 
um, but packaged by an outside party um, on my Acer Aspire 1. And that's pretty good. I, I've got used to the whole maximizing thing. And you can see with a relatively small screen, it's important that it does that. Yeah. And there's a few weird applications that don't quite follow that convention, but mostly just works. See, I actually have Ubuntu Network Remix on my EPC, but I don't actually really use my EPC anymore. You know, I use it probably once every other month or so. See, I, I, I put Crunchbang on mine because I do use it. I thought I need something that just works. And and the netbook remix just irritated me with the fully <laughs> maximizing windows and the stuff. It just it just felt wrong to me. And yeah, I think you're right, Simon. It does need something that's got a, a it, pen or a touchscreen. It definitely works. I mean, it's a great looking interface. And I can see that for somebody who's going to buy a brand new um, netbook, it would be pretty cool. Or, a, or a portable, a portable yes, device yeah. that's got, got a really touchscreen. Great, but yeah. for old farts like us who've been using computers for a long time, who like the way they do things... It's possibly a bit new. It's got to be better than Xandros, though, isn't it? I mean, Old dog, new tricks. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Actually, I quite like the Xandros. I mean, wifey's, wifey's EPC, hers has got Xandros. I didn't even boot mine. I don't think <laughs> really? Did you wipe it straight away? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Hmm. Um, Matt Molyneux says he upgraded his mum's machine, and his response is, meh. Um, he's annoyed that he couldn't go from 804 to 904. Um, and says it's not as smooth as upgrading from Fedora. You can. Which isn't you, right. You can go from 804 to 904. As long as you, you go can. via 810. No, you, no. you can. See, this is the thing. There's a, there's a lot of misinformation about upgrades. You can, for example, upgrade on the command line by editing your sources list and doing a dist upgrade. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, let me finish. You can do that. You can upgrade from an old release to a new release without going through everyone in between. It's just not recommended. It's, it can be done. I upgraded a machine that was on 7.04 uh, last week, and I went from 7.04 to 7.10, and then I think 7.10 to 8.04, and then leapt from 8.04 to 8.10 and skipped. Uh, sorry, 7.10 to 8.10, and I skipped 8.04. That's not recommended, and it might break, and there might be problems with you know some of the packages, but you can do it. It's not that you, it's absolutely verboten. But what are you trying to do in doing that? Skip the 200 meg download of the one no, what, I mean, yeah, but what I mean is what are you trying to do by going from 710 all the way to, to 9 because 710 is unsupported no but what I mean is why don't you just download it and do a clean install oh yeah sure yeah that, that, that's certainly another way to do it but, but an in place upgrade means you get to keep all your settings and you know you don't have to yeah. You know, I, I reset think, stuff. Like. I think one of the reasons people change to Ubuntu is so they don't have to keep reinstalling. I mean, yeah. one of, one of the things about it is you meant to just be able to permanently upgrade and not have to worry about yeah. reinstalling every year or so. Yeah, I hear I hear people in the Fedora and Red Hat community, and I'm not flaming. I'm not having a go at these other distros, but I hear that people have problems with upgrades in um, Fedora and Red Hat. Troll. <coughs> <coughs> Thanks for that, <laughs> um, Mez. On Twitter, Mezzle says he's indifferent about the upgrade. He likes the uh, notification icons, but not the notification area. He thinks they're pretty, but he doesn't like them. Hmm. Make of that what you will. Uh, um, somebody called Six Hat is very happy, has um, installed Jaunty on three machines, and it says it's very, very fast. Probably the most important release of Ubuntu ever. Ooh, blimey. Yeah. That's bold. Lopter, again, says he's very happy with the server, which he did a fresh install of, but not so much with the desktop where he attempted an upgrade. Um, and James Eaton says he'll be sitting on Hardy. He needs the stability provided by the long-term service release. And yep. that's why it's there. Yep. Yeah. See, whereas we like to like, sit on the edge of our pants, you know. And... <laughs> I'd rather not sit on the edge of your pants. <laughs> <laughs> it's been rather light uh, fortnight on the news front, however... Here we go. Jaunty Jackalope was released on time to become Ubuntu 9.04, with an article on CNET describing it as as slick as Windows 7 and Mac OS X. Is it really? Wow. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's pretty nice. I've tried Windows 7 and there are a few nice slick things in there as well. But, yeah, I'm not sure I agree with that. So the obvious new things in 9.04 are the new login screen, the new GDM theme. Yeah, that's come under a bit of um, stick. Yep. But I quite like it, actually. Yeah, I quite like it. It looks quite nice. Notification area. There's, come, there's been a bit of stick about that as well. <laughs> yes. um, boot speed. There's been a bit... No, there hasn't. <laughs> <laughs> My desktop boots in, I think, from Grub to the log-on screen. I think it's under 10 seconds now. Uh, uh, how long from power on? Uh, well, ages, but there's nothing Ubuntu can do about that. Because that's 
BIOS and stuff. We, we could use the Linux uh, Linux BIOS, which has been renamed. Use that. I'm not that dedicated <laughs> or stupid. <laughs> the other thing is uh, the network manager improvements, and also Wubi's had a rewrite. Hang on, with the network manager stuff, you had some awesomeness with that, didn't you? Yeah, that's pretty cool. We'll talk about it later. <laughs> Last time we mentioned that in a survey of companies considering a move away from Windows XP or Vista, 24% were considering Ubuntu. Yay. The full breakdown shows Red Hat in the lead. Ooh. Then, then Ubuntu with Suzy Linux bringing up the rear. That's mm. pretty good. I should say that Mac OS was right at the top above all of the Linux versions. Really? Oh, no. As people at work keep telling me, it's based on Linux. What, Mac? <clears throat> no. Well, we have a friend who works for Apple and he tells me, we're the same, aren't we? We're the same underneath. No. Database mega corporation Oracle have agreed to pay $7.4 bazillion for Sun Microsystems, raising a whole load of questions about the future of MySQL, VirtualBox and OpenOffice.org. Yeah, it's a worrying time, I think, obviously, because a major database vendor has now got a major open source database. Mm. What are they going to do with it? I mean, I think what really gets me is uh, this all started when IBM said they were going to buy uh, Sun, didn't they? And then suddenly Oracle went, oh, oh, we can be one of the big players as well. And it's like, why is this um, this, fasc- this fascination with trying to buy out other companies? He's saying Oracle aren't a big player. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, they're just trying to, I mean, you know, IBM said they were going to do it, and Oracle went, well, we can prove we've we got bigger... Um, cojones. Bigger cojones than, than IBM. Thank, thank you, yeah. yeah. Ubuntu Open Week is well underway. It started on Monday the 27th of April, today, as we record this, but Wednesday by the time you get this. Um, Optimistic. <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> and it runs until the end of the week, so you probably have a day or two left to join in. And the Southeast USA Linux Fest is happening on June the 13th this year. Go along and find out about that. There'll be a link in the show notes. But of course, with the open week, people can actually catch up with what they missed. You know, they can actually read read the, the logs and extracts and stuff. So, sounds fun. A new release of Ubuntu is an opportunity to celebrate the hard work of the community and uh, the canonical employees that have both contributed to uh, a distribution. Um, but sometimes, and this release in particular, it seems like there's a little bit more stress um, between the two, uh, not factions, that's not quite the right word, but you know, the two sort of sides of the coin, if you like. Um, in particular, this time, about the update notification area and mm-hmm. the um, the signalling of when there's a new update uh, or security updates available for your system. Now, we talked a little bit about this in a previous episode, um, and I don't really want to talk about that events specifically so much but just the idea of, of when the community um might have too much voice in the decisions and when a company a commercial entity should have the right just to tell people to shut up and put up with it or whether the community should always be listened to are the users always right um so alan's been following this debate quite closely <laughs> and has commented it on a few times um what are your thoughts on this i i well from for that specific bug yeah i i am willing to just let uh, this release slide and see how it works out. I'm not necessarily majorly pro the changes or against the changes for that specific issue, but I do think there has been a lot of um, gnashing and wailing and gnashing of teeth from actually quite a small number of people. Okay, there's 260 odd comments on that bug, but from mostly the same set of people, and it's the same set of people on both sides. You know, there's a few new people who've now upgraded to Jaunty and they're you know, new users or they're existing mm-hmm. users. For the most part, they seem to be existing users who are complaining about the change and the fact that they weren't listened to or when they scroll back through the comments in the bug, they see that other people weren't listened to. So it's not necessarily that they weren't listened to, it's that the community wasn't listened to. But there's, in, there's a vision, isn't there? Um, this whole thing was pitched at UDS back in December and we saw a little animation, of a mock-up of how it would work. And, yeah, there's... and there were complaints about that as well, that, 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 that um, UDS is, is not a conference. It's a, it's a developer summit. And mm. so you're not going to get users at UDS who can get involved in that conversation about this new strategy. Mm. But Mark put it on his blog. Yeah, he put one little video um, and a screenshot on his blog and okay it was a very lengthy blog post and went into a lot of detail about you know stuff but there was no i think from a lot of people's point of view there was no option it was 
this is the way it's going to be. And they'd, I think a lot of people don't like that. They would like to have an option to switch it off. Define people. Uh, users. Well. And even developers as well. There's been some developers on that, on that bug who've complained as well. But, you know, everyone's the same. It's this, there, there shouldn't be a, a hierarchy. It should be everyone has the same no, they're always, ability. No, to, there is a hierarchy. Well, there is. Yeah, there's going to be. But what, I'm, what I mean is developers and users alike can both voice their opinion and, and be listened to. Maybe. And it's always the developers who get to make the final decision, though. Well, it, it, I mean, if it's the developers actually doing the work, then there, there could be a bit more debate there, really. You know, if yeah. I mean, you know, if people don't like it, then you know, the, the source code is open. <laughs> Fork but, it. But the, pro- the problem is we, it, it, it's very difficult to do these things in a design by committee. You know, you, you end up with, um, do you remember that blog post that... Um, the giraffe. Celeste Lynn Paul wrote about um pigeon not about giraffes no it was about it was about do you remember when um pigeon had this problem where the um the input field the developers of pigeon decided to make that non-resizable and some people got really annoyed about that and annoyed about the fact that there wasn't a button that you could press to make it resizable the input Mm. field and so they forked pigeon and created this new one called carrier carrier im Right, um, and the idea was that the community would more have more input on the design of this fork of Pigeon. Yep. Um, um, Celeste's blog post was going on about design by committee doesn't work, and she showed a picture of the Homer Simpson's car that had been yeah. designed. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if you remember that, but she had a lot of good points about the fact that you, you can't do this kind of thing. It would never get off the ground. We would never have released last week if we sat and debated about it ad infinitum. Yeah, and some people might have ideas about what they want, but realistically and practically, they're not actually the right way to do it from a design point of view. Yeah. They, you know, there might be a better way of doing it that actually suits everybody better, but it takes somebody from outside the project or with a professional design experience background or something to actually make that happen in a usable way. It's also difficult to do it in a six-month cycle. Yeah, you know, I mean, but should there be an underlying long-term project as well, as well as the six-month cycle? Should there be a, a sort of thinking about the next... You know, should we be thinking about the next LTS now? There is. There is a, a, a project which I will find the name of in a minute because it doesn't spring to mind. It's... Ayatana, I think, A Y A T A N A, A Y A T A N A, and it is the the design project within the Ubuntu project to formulate that long term plan of what the design. Did that actually get off the ground? Yeah, there's a there's a new there's a new team, new mailing list. It's all kicked off, and Mark's posted to it saying, "Okay, what do we want to see in the new design?" There was a lot of talk at UDS about design and the influence of the user interface in Ubuntu, which perhaps more than there had been before. To my interpretation, anyway. But the problem is UDS isn't where users can get involved. No, no, no. But it was it was obvious that, that people were being employed to work on that aspect of Ubuntu where there hadn't been before. There was, you know, a new team was being formed and, and there was seemed to be some momentum in that direction. Sure. But the th- thing is with, uh, I mean, with UDS, blueprints are formed. Uh, so this is what we'll talk about. And, I mean, they're, they're generally ratified probably about a month before um, the actual UDS. So it does give people a chance to actually comment before the actual they could they could add like comments to that for example. Yeah, but the Mark's blog post didn't come out until during UDS or after UDS. I can't remember to be because honest. it was about the same time. It I was the same remember. time because Mark yeah. showed it off in the plenary room at UDS the new notification system and no nobody had seen it before then. Yeah, you know, I I spoke to Mark a month before that or a month or two before that at the release party for Intrepid and try to get out of him what this new design stuff was. Because he obviously knew that's what it was, this notification system. And he wasn't going to tell anyone, you know, outside a small core of people. And then, bam, to great fanfare, it was released at, at uh, UDS. But no, there wasn't a, a great way for the community to get involved in that. With, at UDS. With, um, with this release, as we said at the beginning, there has been a number of issues where people have got quite excited about things they don't like. You know, mm-hmm. they, they've been you know, very annoyed. Uh, and I think we touched on this on a previous episode, but what we're seeing more now is a very heavy um, saying, no, this is how we're doing it. It's not up for discussion. That, that, that's how I feel a lot of these are turning out. Well, yeah, hang on. This is, it's always going to come to that. It's almost a, you know, a management of, of, um, of roles, and people need to understand what they can and can't do. As a user, I absolutely know that I can't do anything apart from voice and opinion. And getting wound up about it is completely pointless. It's a complete and utter waste of time. 
And the developers getting wound up back at users, is, again, is a complete and utter waste of time. Their developers read what's on Launchpad and get back to developing. Now, if it, you know, this sort of stuff goes on again, then surely we need to get, I won't say um, you know, the community manager involved, but a, some sort of manager to say, look, guys, thanks for your input, and developers... <laughs> Shut up, and get on with <laughs> developing. But you know, you need to keep things calm because this is just ridiculous. Two hundred and sixty comments on this one bug alone. Mm. That's and know. a lot of it's going over the same stuff over and over again. Mm. It's it's it doesn't move forward. And you find someone like Matthew Paul Thomas, who's one of the architects of this thing, ends up repeating himself, you know, over and over again. And you, and you can see the guys clearly, you know, wasting time in inverted commas having to reply to the same thing over and over again. Honestly, mm. when a bug report goes over 10, 15 comments, especially detailed paragraphs, uh, I, I, I glaze over them. Have a look at bug number reading. one. How many comments are there on bug number yeah, one? Yeah, when did you last actually <laughs> read all them? I mean, I think I've read... <laughs> Never yeah. read any of them. <laughs> I don't know. The, the number of comments is fair enough if it is a technical thing and people are trying to debug it or whatever through a series of comments. But when it's just rants... Yeah, but yeah it's it, like it, a forum. It, people are using the bug report like a forum. They're for venting their spleen about how this annoys Yeah, but them. It's, it's the wrong medium to be doing that. I mean, they're basically using IRC via a forum. Mm. You know, if it's if having a discussion... So, what, so what's the right way? How, what's the right way? If, if the community felt strongly that this was the wrong thing or that a thing, not necessarily this thing, but something in Ubuntu was wrong, what's the right way for them to articulate that? Well, I wonder if it wasn't so much that they disagreed with it, but the fact that they felt they didn't have an opportunity to discuss it before it was implemented. I mean, obviously they do disagree with it, but both, yeah. if you have the opportunity, maybe you feel less uh, less bad about it or less um, you know, strongly about it because mm. you feel like you've had your chance to have your say. And I don't know whether there is a, the right place for doing that because the forums are very much sort of user based and and helping each other out with with problems with the distribution. There's IRC channels, and I'm sure it was discussed a lot in the, in relevant IRC channels. There's mailing lists, and but is Launchpad the the right place for that? No, <laughs> I don't. I don't think it is. But but where is so, the right? So place? what is? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are there are. Well, that's one of the things. This Ayatana team have um, a mailing list they have a launchpad mm. team and so so there is a place now for the focus of the design stuff in ubuntu and hopefully people can get involved in that but what happened here was essentially you know mark ended up posting saying look this is just how it's going to be for this release we're going to give it a go see what people think in this release and, and review it mm. but basically it's happening but that so, stuff's happened before that's yeah. been duff that's that's been reverted like the spatial windows in one of the previous releases and the the crazy calendar with the half naked people you know some of these are duff decisions that have been undone and maybe we need to cut them some slack and yeah. you know try this stuff out oh yeah absolutely but i mean for a, a distribution that prides itself on community involvement mm. uh, having somebody essentially say no even if it is essentially his toy okay so if, if um, he says if he doesn't say no then what happens then it, the conversation carries on for months and months and months and nothing happens yeah <laughs> and we don't yeah. get a release. Yeah, well, fair <laughs> enough. Um, Mike Basinger on uh, the Twitter or the Identica um, says that community involvement is never a hindrance, but in the case of the update notify debate, the developer is allowed to have a vision, which I think is fair enough, yeah. uh, a vision of the notification system, and they should be allowed to complete it before adding lots of community feedback. So that's almost a you know, develop it and then throw it over the wall and then get well, your feedback sort of, on that's it. That's management by process, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, that's really what they're doing. Hmm. Um, and Colin McCarthy says that the uh, and he's talking specifically about the Ubuntu update notifier. He says it's God's gift to software updating. <laughs> <laughs> Microsoft XP's forced updates and reboots are the work of the devil, which is obviously the, the truth. Um, but um, Laura <laughs> over in the corner has been adding her own comments to this, um, and she says that somebody basically has to make a decision in the end. Um, and there are people for and against, and I guess the developers are the people who get to make the decision, or the design team, or whatever. Um, users aren't designers. They have opinions about what they want in general. And uh, developers aren't necessarily good UI designers either, which is a very fair point. Does anyone else help but wonder whether some people are making a big deal about a small issue because they've got that freedom to do that? Mm, no, I hadn't really thought of it that way before. Um, Fabian from uh, the Linux Outlaws podcast, who should be busy recording his own podcast, not <laughs> commenting on ours, um, <laughs> because they do it on a, a Monday night as well. Um, he says that if you think the, uh, the community is 
um, the, the cause of the problem in this case, you know, your, your process is at fault or one's process is at fault. Maybe the developers should reconsider uh, their approach. Community involvement is a good thing. Yeah. Which it, it probably is. I think I agree with that. I think this will just continue to roll on for the rest of this, the rest of Episode. this release, really. Oh, well. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll see where we are in six months' time. We managed to miss the result of the competition in the last episode. Oops. Uh, the winner of the Ubuntu goodie bag, which contains a T-shirt, book, uh, it was the Ubuntu Kung Fu book, and other bits and bobs, was Chris Yeriatsin from Switzerland. I do apologize, apologize if I've mispronounced your name and mispronounced apologize. <laughs> <laughs> I should also point out there's not an actual bag. It's just a collection of things. I did I, put goodie bag, but there's no physical bag. I, pr- I, yeah. I think we can get a plastic bag from somewhere. Okay. Or probably, oh God. Same no, Laura's, probably same Laura, a bag. Laura's giving me filthy looks. Not a plastic bag. Probably yeah, from our local bag. generic supermarket. Yes, yeah, that'd yeah, be good. Yeah. Um, we should also give a special mention to Scott James Remnant, who managed to get the answer to the question wrong. Fail. <laughs> and especially good effort, given the question was about his software project. Well done, <laughs> Scott. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> I suspect it was slightly tongue-in-cheek. I don't yes. know. Right, so a new competition to uh, celebrate the release of Jaunty. We've got a limited edition T-shirt from UDS Jaunty. If you'd like the chance to win this prize, email in your answer to this question. Where was UDS Jaunty? A. Barcelona. B. Prague. C. Mountain View. Or D. Cliff Richard in 1973 with congratulations. Email your answer to competition at ubuntu-uk.org by Sunday the 10th of May. Good luck, everybody. We are delving back into the murky depths of the Ubuntu ecosphere with Alan's strange naming of the segment. Look, if anyone doesn't like the name of it, please suggest new yeah. names for this. We could call it Black Box or like uh, just Ecosphere. Just ah, Sounds okay, good. Right, it irritates Dave. Work Let's it. keep it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah like, tag an 0845 number to it as well. <laughs> <laughs> and the first thing in the Ecosphere this week we have found is that Pascal Turjan has made a blog post about the um, non-redistributable stuff that's in Ubuntu's um, repositories still, mm. uh, including things like DVB firmware. And he said he uh, either saw a, blog, uh, a bug about it or made the, a bug posting about it a while ago, and there's been a little bit of action on it, but generally there's still quite a bit of uh, non-redistributable stuff in there. Very interesting well, it, read. It, it, it's it not is. actually necessarily non-redistributable. It's more a case of we don't actually know for sure because there's, I mean, a lot of the DVB firmwares come from companies that are quite happy to give it out, but we just haven't got a copy of the license that says yeah. we can do that. We've just the bug reports have got like, please include this firmware, and it just links directly to a, a .fw firmware file with no license, no indication of where it came from or anything. And actually, I tried to get a um, a copy of the uh, agreement for a, a quite a popular DVB card about a year or two ago, and um, I wrote to the person actually hosting it on their own. Home's homepage. Um, there was also the Linux DVB project was hosting it, and also the manufacturer. And I tried emailing all three, and I couldn't get a response. Basically saying, "Can I have a copy of the license so we can include it?" Mm. And I didn't get anything from anyone. Of course, the difficult thing is if you start leaving this stuff out, then people's tuners and things stop working. Yep, and then yeah, they get the, complaints. It's much the same as the the state of um, wireless firmware, like Broadcom drivers, that kind of stuff. You know, the the, the stuff we don't put in the kernel but this somehow is... Yeah, but I suppose, you know, technically, legally, you should err on the side of caution. And things, yeah, totally. But I suspect sometimes the manufacturers aren't being very clear, as Dave was saying, mm. about what license is un- under in the first place. Yeah. And maybe there has been some communication going on that we don't know about that says, yeah, yeah, distribute it, you know, it's all fine. Yeah. Right, next, um, to save a significant amount of space, about six meg, um, we dump bloated C-based rhythm box and in, uh, include the Svelte lightweight C-based, C-sharp-based Banshee. Yeah, this was a blog post from jo- Joseph Shields, who's direct mm. hex on, on IRC. Okay. He's quite big on his C-sharp mono, I believe. Yeah. yeah, And I guess it's for saving space on the CD, the distribution yes. CD, okay. which is obviously yeah. quite limited. So six megs quite a lot. That's quite a chunky amount of space, really, isn't it? Plus Banshee's pretty good. Um, yeah, but Rhythm Box he, isn't. Yeah, but hasn't Rhythm Box been put on pause? Isn't it's not going to be? Yeah, that's part of the more? point he makes yeah. in the in the blog post. But you can unpause it and it carries on playing from where you left. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, the developers said. I mean, we mentioned this yeah, last we did time. This last week. Yeah, that last he's week. not um, doing any further development. It's just bug fixes. So there's a disk space saving to be made, and you get uh, arguably better application at the end of it as well. Yes, and an arguably more actively developed. Well, not arguably. It is more yeah. actively developed. 
application. But the downside is it's mono. Solaris Mansur uh, come up with a suggestion about replacing Exane with Gnome Scan. Now, this is the tool for scanning documents using a flatbed scanner, uh, presumably. Yeah. And um, I'm not sure of his reasons for wanting to do it, to be honest. Well, basically, he says that Exane is horrible. Yeah. It mm-hmm. is. It's so old interface. and crusty, isn't it? It's like GTK1 or something like that. But it does have features that Gnome Scan doesn't, like network scanning. Yeah, I mean, it's quite featureful, and it does work, but it is not yeah. a very intuitive well, interface. Like I said before, I bought my HP new HP printer scanner copier thing, plugged it in, opened up Xsane, and I wanted to scan 11 pages, put the pages in, press the scan button, done. See, I um, I do network-based scanning, and I do that um, via scripts that work via command line tools, and that can go straight into GIMP and things like that. Yeah, that's not ideal for end users, though, is it? I don't know. I mean, I can actually network scan by pressing the button on the scanner, and it will appear in GIMP on my desktop. But how much of that is out of the box going to work? Uh, well, uh, yeah, okay. There you go. <laughs> the package is... The, the pack- okay, it's just... It's a, put a GUI on it. Package. Put a GUI on it, and uh, I'm sure it'll be lovely. But yeah, the idea of having a, like a nice front-ended yeah. thing... Would a be- simple thing that most people can use, and if you really yeah. want to get heavy with it, you can install Xsane and, and live yeah. with the, the pain of it. Well, it's not that painful, is it? Ruben Romero Cordero, I think, uh, has posted on the Ubuntu marketing list about the Spread Ubuntu marketing site. Um, it's been on, uh, I think it's been on his uh, one of his personal domains or on a, a bit of hosting that doesn't look like it's an official site. Um, and the idea of the site is that he wants uh, to promote Ubuntu and uh, do that uh, with a centralised repository for things like posters and artwork. And, uh, DIY marketing. So yeah, was a like, DIY marketing page, wasn't there? Yeah, there, there still is a DIY marketing page on the wiki, but this this looks nicer. It's like a bit more Web 2.0. It's based on the spread Firefox, wasn't it? Because yeah, like, yeah, that was hugely popular. Wasn't yeah, it? but it's but it's going to have. Well, the the idea is that it launches soon with a with an official domain. Oh, cool. Chris Rosen has posted about the ATI drivers being broken in Jaunty. This never goes away, does it? There's always yeah. one driver, manufacturer or another, who is busy me- messing things up for everybody. Well, it's pretty bad, bad for all of them, apparently, in Jaunty. Cause, um, uh, the NVIDIA one's broken as well. I've heard of a few people reporting breakage with NVIDIA, and the Intel driver sucks a bit at the moment as well. Oh, fantastic. So, you know, it's lose all round. But every so often we get, oh, ATI got bought by AMD, and it was all going to be a fantastic open source thing, and that hasn't happened yet. And then NVIDIA were going to be uh, the open source re-implementation of the NVIDIA drivers, and that's going on, but not you know, not done. I don't, I don't think we're uh, we're alone on this. I think Windows people have this kind of problem as well. Yeah, but the thing is, to be fair, I mean, we say, oh, you know, they're not really coming out with it. But, um, I mean, we start to think this about Java, uh, well, Sun open sourcing Java. We thought, it's never going to happen. We're waiting. We had to wait for about 18 months or so. It did happen eventually. So I think we probably will see it. We've been Just... waiting for decent 3D graphics support for years. Yeah. Since, like, you know, before I started using Linux. Yeah, but it's only been getting serious for about a year or so, hasn't it? Mm. Well, the bad thing about this is actually that Linux gets a bad rep. And yeah. it's, it's nothing to do with Linux. It's, yeah, the, it's the, you know, the manufacturer's not providing the drivers. Yeah. I mean, Ubuntu has done leaps and bounds to make it easier to install non-free... Rubbish drivers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's really easy to but, install I mean, crap, nah, broken drivers. It's, it's, but in this case, they're not there. Or, yeah. you know, they, they don't do the 3D acceleration, so you don't get all the swish goodness. that so much effort is going into polishing mm. the desktop. Come on, vendors, get with it. Yeah. Right, issue 24 of Full Circle Magazine is out. Um, and um, we've got an ad in there. Yes. Ooh. Yeah, my, um, Ronnie Tucker, who, um, does, who manages the Full Circle Magazine... Um, and has done since the start, 24 issues ago, um, posts posted to the marketing list asking for adverts because he had a couple of spare slots. And I said, oh, I don't suppose you can do one for the Ubuntu podcast. And he created it himself. It's very nice. Very kind of him. Yeah, and you can download the podcast from Inside Full Circle magazine by clicking the link. Excellent. So now, having heard about it on this podcast, you can go and download Full Circle magazine and download the podcast. Now, hang on. Of, of course, hang on. No, no. If you also print out the PDF... You also can't click the actual printed copy either. You can only click. You can't. It you can't click on a piece of paper. No, you can't print no, out our podcast right. either. Uh, I, I know it's a that's a bug. That is going to fix that. Daily builds of Chromium are available now. This is the free source, free software implementation of uh, Google uh, Chrome. Google Chrome, Chrome, of course. Um, and uh, we, we we did hear about it a few months ago now, but they were mm. actually saying don't use it. 
Although no, they're got, saying don't don't file bugs on it. Don't don't report bugs to the developers. Don't blog about it. Don't yeah, basically, don't use basically it. <laughs> keep it secret. We're doing these daily builds, but please don't you know publish the fact we're doing these yeah, daily builds. And a few people have blogged about it. Well. Well, dealing with the community, isn't it? Yeah. Well, the reason is they know that it's broken. <laughs> it's like you know, this is so badly broken. You know, we know it's any not, bug though. fix. It's not. I tried it, and I was I was pretty impressed to be honest. Well, yeah. I mean, it, it works in as far as you can browse certain sites, but there are breakages like most of the di- if you tried any of the dialogues they just don't work so yeah it's it's a bit broken the the actual launcher also opened up a terminal window first if i remember correctly. nice well it's a debug you know yeah. useful menus are overrated anyway yes matt zimmerman has written about how he migrated to ext4 on his blog on his um jaunty laptop and um yeah i tried it out myself and it works it's really Excellent. cool and the new features did what for you um, well, ah, now it's funny you should say that. He also mentions about how you can improve performance using some of the new features in the XD4, but in order to take advantage of those, um, you need to follow the, some of the steps that he goes through, but it's actually quite easy. Um, so, for example, you can end up with quite fragmented files in the XD3, especially very large files or files that get accessed a lot, like um, some of the SQL light databases, in his example, that mm. come as part of Firefox. Or if you're using VirtualBox, the the um, the big images. The disk or, image. Sorry, the did disk you say images. MySQL or SQL Lite? Because he said SQL Lite. Oh, okay, okay. I need to. Yeah, I wasn't um, not listening fast enough. So, um, what you can do is those files become fragmented, and what he suggests you do is copy them to create a new copy of the file, and then delete the original and rename these back to to make the shrink them down and use less extents. And apparently, that's better for ext4. And he said that his IMAP store, which is obviously lots of little files, yeah. um, was quicker as well. Oh, that's good. Yeah, he did some sync tests and things like that. So, so now you've done a migration, are you feeling the speed? White Actually, knuckles? On, my, on my desktop, I've got two installs, one that's using EXT3 and one that's using EXT4. And some I don't know why it is, but the EXT4 seems to rattle the disks a bit more. I don't know whether that's it's doing more I.O. or it's throwing more data at the disk faster or flushing faster or something, but... It's probably, my, my PC is louder with the XT4. It's probably another crayon inside rattling oh, around. <laughs> that could be it. Um, Stephen J. Vaughan Nichols has written an article on computerworld.com about the slowest machines that can run Linux acceptably. Yeah, I chucked this in because I thought it would be a good question to ask you guys. What the sl- I know we've talked about the low power machines we've got, but what's the absolute slowest thing you run Linux on? Uh, the Viglin MPC <laughs> has got to be pretty slow. It's a 400 megahertz um, thing. AMD geode. AMD geode with 128 meg of RAM. Or might uh, even be more no, than that. No, it's half a gig. It's half a gig of RAM. So it's quite yeah. a lot of RAM, but a quite, pretty slow processor. I've got a Great Panasonic you. Toughbook at work. I'm trying to put damn small Linux on, but I'm really struggling. And well, when it does... Is it? Oh, I can't remember. It's one of the old ones. Right. Um, but it's, um, it does clunk and work quite a bit. I think the slowest box I'm running on is a, a 633 megahertz with 192 meg of RAM, I believe. Is that full Ubuntu? No. What's that running? That's a headless uh, Ubuntu server. Well, um, Stephen, in his article, talks about running it on a Pentium 2 266. And that, that's not Ubuntu, that's sort of puppy Linux, lightweight, lightweight things. And he ran damn small Linux on a 33 megahertz 486 <laughs> PC. <laughs> I thought I, I got my one with my 233 running IP cop, my oh. Pentium 2 233. I think, I think having it as an embedded device or an asterisk server or a headless box doesn't count. That's cheap. Yeah, exactly. It's got to be something that runs a GUI and that you actually use to do work. Actually, we should link to, um, oh, there's a page it? on the Hampshire Lug wiki, um, Hugo's Random Benchmark. Oh, yes. Where it, it just it's something we, it's really stupid. In our local lug, we um, a lot of us ran this benchmark, which basically gets Perl to count to a billion or something, yeah. and you time it and see how long it takes. It's completely pointless. It's not a benchmark, and we've posted the stats for all of these. We should link to that because that's quite cool. Because at the very very bottom of the list is some of the slowest rubbish hardware <laughs> that runs it. I tried that on like a sixteen core server once. And like, and I'm sure it only uses one core. It does. I was expecting to get like really excited. I was going to take like n- like nanoseconds to do it. I keep nagging Hugo to make a multi-core version of his. Counter he needs to rewrite Perl. Well, to- there is that as well. <laughs> he, well. I did ask him to make a multi-threaded version, but it wasn't happening. The, the slowest one on there at the moment is a one three three megahertz um, SGI box, which oh, wow. took six minutes, <laughs> six and a half minutes. And the one to at the top, and the one at the top of the list takes five seconds or something to count to a billion. 
Um, no, l- less than that. Oh, no, sorry. That was me reading somebody put deep thought in there, yes. uh, which is 0.0001 seconds. Very funny. Um, yeah, other than that, it's a three gigahertz box, which takes about five seconds to do. Yeah. From the Twitter sphere, Scrolliontis, yeah, Scrolliontis um, says he's got a Power PC 233 meg uh, with 128 meg of RAM um, running Ubuntu. Yeah, I think that's his daily machine, actually. He sits on IRC in that all the time. And. Um, Rid Sevilla, I'm not quite sure how you pronounce that. Um, has got a Pentium 3, 500 megahertz, 128 megaram running Gen 2. So, wow, yeah. that's hardcore. <laughs> yeah, I boot speeds are there, presumably. I wonder if he actually compiled it on the box or farmed it out. Yeah. Well, if he's compiling it on the box, it's probably still compiling, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I've actually got a Flame 4 6 in the loft, and I might actually try Ubuntu on there actually this week. Yeah, give it a go, and then you can report back in the next episode. And uh, see, if, see how it goes. If it hasn't got clogged with dust, then otherwise damp and broke. But yeah. And well, that's about it from the ecosphere this time. It's time for your feedback. Alan, who's the first email from? It's from Ed Hewitt, and he says, In your last podcast, you talked about the Rhythmbox developers stopping work on the project, and you all thought the project might end. About a year ago, uh, Ed and another developer took over an open source project called GFire. He thought it would tell you. Oh God! He thought he would tell us. I can't recalculate the tenses and the. And the <laughs> so I'll just read it. Uh, he says, "I thought I would tell you how it's gone." GFire is a plugin for the Pigeon IM client, which allows the user to connect to the XFire network, which I had never heard of. No. XFire is a very popular chat network aimed at gamers. Ah, oh, that's, that's why we've never heard of it. We've never heard of. I was going to say, ever so popular, <laughs> none of us have heard of it. Uh, stop scrolling the screen, I can't read it, Tony. <laughs> Which allows gamers to chat with friends while they're in the game, keep track of other gaming stats, and allow people to join others in games. Basically, it's like Xbox Live for the PC gamers. However, the XFire client is Windows only. Boo. This means <laughs> GFire is the only Linux client. And it's an important project for Linux gaming. Yep, sounds like a good idea. In March 2008, the developer announced that he would not be developing GFire anymore, but he asked for people to take over. Ed offered to take over, as well as another developer. They got talking and decided where to take the project next. It's not been... It's been... Oh, crikey. It's not been over a year since we revived the project. And we're very happy and proud with the year the way we've turned this project around. We've managed to release four versions of GFAR over the year, new website, new community, via forums and a new IRC channel, and a wiki. And the website is gfire.sf.net. Well, that's a good tale of it happening and yeah. working. so the project's the... not dying. Yeah, yeah, and obviously not even just not dying, but actually thriving. Thriving. Yeah, yeah. yeah. cool. Nice well one. done, Ed. Yay! <laughs> Mark Faulkner um, has written in following our recommendation of Dropbox. I'm not sure whether we um, actually oh. recommended Dropbox. We did talk about it. Same I, as, prob- same as, I probably yeah, did. No, it, actually, it might be yeah. our every episode mention Gen- of, of the, Dropbox. The, the, the oh. dro- Dropbox or oh, Drobo. 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 Yeah, yeah, see, yeah, see yeah. We, we love all the yeah. proprietary yeah. nonsense. Absolutely. And actually, didn't Drobo have some bad news recently? Did they? Who? Oh, anyway, never mind. Um, <laughs> anyway, so Mark Faulkner wrote in saying, following our apparent recommendation of Dropbox, which was back in season one, he's been using it on several computers and thinks it's great. However, he asks if we've looked at the terms and conditions, as they're a bit scary. Basically, they own your soul. Any comments? Yeah, don't use proprietary yeah. software. Don't use it. Yeah. <laughs> Wait for iFolder to be completed. Yeah. Carry uh, a big USB stick around. <laughs> yeah, big USB stick across all of your computers. <laughs> Self-replicating USB sticks. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Right, Dave Robertson uh, wrote it. Uh, just wanted to say thank you. I wrote in with a question about Ubuntu, Kubuntu uh, conflict way back in season one, episode 16, he thinks, and was most surprised when it featured in the show. Thanks for that. The segment was very interesting. Also wanted to say that you shouldn't worry about the show quality now you're recording it live. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> Might change your mind after this one. I haven't noticed a difference at all, apart from one moment where somebody <laughs> nearly choked on a biscuit. <laughs> that, was that, was me. that was Alan. Um, as ever, looking forward to hearing more and hope season two will continue to be fun packed. Well, we try. Thank you very much. But there's no cookies in the cookie jar. Right, we've got a voicemail. Hi, guys. I've just recently discovered the podcast and I'm slowly making my way through all the old episodes. Um, my name is Richard Falk, and I've been using Ubuntu for a couple of years on the desktop, having been a user of other distros for about 10 years or so. And um, I'd just like to share a tip. If you're running out of disk space, you can free some up by removing the older kernels that you're no longer using. 
just make a note of the old kernels that you have listed in your grub config and then use um, Synaptic to um, remove them. It's a shame Ubuntu doesn't do this by default, especially now that we have DKMS to automatically recompile third-party modules, but never mind. Um, thanks for your great work, and I'll keep listening. OK, bye. What a nice man. Yeah. Good man. It's nice to have voicemails. You actually hear people. Yeah. So leave voicemails, please. It's a, it's a double whammy of fantastic, because uh, uh, he gave us lovely compliments and a great tip. And we get, yeah. to, have, and we get to have a break whilst we're listening. Yeah, mm. this is true. Okay, um, Josh Holland sent us an email and he said, You guys have no idea how happy that big band music made me feel. <laughs> okay, uh, I think I deserve special mention because I actually downloaded the first episode on my phone, resulting, I think, in going over the acceptable use for the phone <laughs> so I can no longer access the mobile internet. <laughs> it was worth it, though. Oh, oh, thank you. You plugged all those people at Brighton Uni's projects. So I think, as a long-time listener, I deserve something similar. Well, do you now? Okay, fine. <laughs> yeah, stop there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. My project is called Suvat, spelled S-U-V-A-T. And its homepage is launchpad.net slash Suvat. It uses the equations of uniformly accelerated motion to find various details about the movement of a particle. You lost me after it uses. Yeah, it sounds riveting. It's a physics thing. I think. <laughs> oh. It's written in Python with a C extension for speedier calculation. The actual writing is as far as I can see done, but I can't fathom out the packaging. Oh. If any listeners know these things, please get in touch uh, with me on my email address or through Launchpad. Keep it up, guys. Great show. Oh, P.S. Stop saying Ubuntu-UK. According to ANSI, the character... Minus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how do you read that now? <laughs> yeah, is either hyphen or minus. Um, but I, I, I'm going to call it dash, just, just because you don't want me to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's you um, not listening to the community again, Dave. <laughs> it's an efficiency saving. Dash is one syllable, whereas hyphen and minus are both you know, polysyllabic. I've, I've really never thought about it that hard. Oh, it's, it's time saving. Actually, no, we need to consult the community and have, raise a bug on Launchpad and have 260 <laughs> comments about it. Yeah. So. <laughs> Are you a dash person, a hyphen person, or a minus person? Simon Benny wrote in and says, I just listened to the second episode of your show. I decided to give it a go downloading over the air to my Android phone. Oh, get you. Yeah, sure. with str- which strangely works better with the OG format than MP3. Well, That's good to know. It's not that strange. <laughs> the format, we get a few complaints about the format of our show. Uh, you mentioned that the new VirtualBox has 3D acceleration. Do you know if it will allow Windows games to be played in guest sessions? Also, will any of you be at the Manchester release party that happened four days ago? Uh, no, we won't be at the party. Well, maybe. We'll have to wait and see. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> uh, what was the question that Tony just scrolled off the top of the screen? About it was about box. the acceleration oh, inside yes. VirtualBox. I think it doesn't do all of the extensions to OpenGL and DirectX that would be needed by very beefy uh, 3D games. So it's simple 3D acceleration, basically. The desktop effects type thing. Yeah, and even then that breaks. <laughs> so, uh, Why? I it's say, not perfect. I say suck it and see and let us know. Yeah. Excellent. Gordon Allett wrote in to say that um, he wanted to point out that one of the things raised as a positive for Ubuntu Tweak was that it removes old kernels. In Jaunty, there is a computer janitor in System Administration Computer Janitor. Is that under the menu? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, System Administration. Um, it will remove old kernels, amongst other things, that are not needed. In inverted how, commas. Yeah, I don't know how it defines not Basically, needed. if you've got any packages on your system that weren't installed um, via a repository, it, it will is that, tick those as being old and need to be cruft. It, is that what used to be called cruft remover? Yes. Ah, okay. okay. All right, so it's now a system janitor. Uh, computer janitor. Computer janitor, sorry. Yes. It, but it actually got renamed twice, I think, because they, they wanted to call it system cleaner, but that was a trademark thing. So now it's computer janitor. Thank you, Gord. Cafe Ninja, good man, has reviewed the podcast on his uh, website and we'll put a link to it uh, on the show notes. Yeah, he said some very nice things. Giles Patterson, he emailed us and he said, I just thought I'd drop a line having been bitten by a combination of factors, which means that I won't be able to upgrade to Jaunty anytime soon. Basically, due to changes to X server and ATI deciding to drop support for a vast swathes of their not so old product line. Those of us with ATI graphics cards will be faced with a choice of sticking with Intrepid or making do with the open source radian drivers and missing out on the 3D acceleration love. Compass and funky things that the new notification system in Jaunty brings. 
Both my home laptop and work laptop have now unsupported ATI, ATI cards in them. Boo. It's even more annoying as my work laptop is only a year old. Jeez, That's crazy. That is yeah. appalling. It's disappointing this situation has arisen. It certainly made me determine never to get another ATI graphics card again. Hopefully the open source drivers will be able to add 3D acceleration before too long. But that's not likely to be until around September, October or so. Hopefully in time for the next release. According to some people's reports I've heard. At least my Myth Bunsy box has an NVIDIA card. So I have one machine I can enjoy the benefits of Jaunty on. With the addition of nasty evil proprietary <laughs> yeah. drivers. Yeah, unfortunately that's the case. Yeah, because the new notification thing does look pretty whack with uh, without um, 3D acceleration or... Uh, or compensating does, does it? it and yeah. it uh, we talked about it in the previous oh, episode didn't we looks fine and presumably his myth buntu box has got a full screen GUI on it for most of the time so it's irrelevant anyway if it's a myth buntu thing mm. oh well, that's some difficult times for graphics then mm. and that about wraps up your feedback except for what has been said on twitter which is what we're going to talk about now <laughs> 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 nicely recovered there tony yeah Scralionitis says um, feedback is that we rock well that goes without saying thanks very much we yeah. did know that but feel free to tell us more often <laughs> please <laughs> Mez says that we suck um, oh. thanks Mez so do you um, no seriously he um, he says we should broadcast as we record for more random fun well oh God, maybe <laughs> maybe one day <laughs> Monkey Junkie uh, sent us a thanks for pronouncing my surname correct last episode. Is that what, junkie? junkie? It's not that hard, <laughs> is it? <laughs> Simon Weirs. Ah. Or uh, Weirs. I can't remember how he pronounced it last Well, episode. either way, you said One both, us, yeah. so you're lucky. So <laughs> covered all bases. Yeah. Not many people manage it straight off, he says. Well, failed on that one, didn't they? And that about wraps up your feedback. <laughs> Okay, ladies and gentlemen of the Ubuntu UK podcast world, thanks for listening. Thanks to everyone who took part via Twitter and Identica. If you'd like to get a hold of us, you can email the show via podcast at ubuntu-uk.org mm, <laughs> or leave uh, 30 seconds of voicemail on 0845-508-1986. Or you can contact us on our IRC channel on the Freenode network, hash ubuntu dash UK. You can send us comments on Identica via identity.cast slash UUPC or Twitter, which is twitter.com slash UUPC, as well as getting updates from recording sessions. And you can find us on Facebook. Search for Ubuntu UK Podcast. And we now have a, a new Ubuntu UK Podcast fan page. Not, do, not yeah, just a group anymore. Do we have any fans? Is we it just us? 77 at the no. moment. Ooh, yeah. I was created an officer of that the other day. Yeah, that was a mistake. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Uh, we welcome suggestions, material, tips, reviews, rants and feedback, both positive and negative, so please do get in touch. Thank you to our network of community mirrors, um, which, which are, are listed on the not, website. Still not listed on the website. <laughs> the ones that Dave promised in episode one and Alan promised in episode two would yeah. be listed on the website. Well, no, I promised to nag Dave. Dave. Which okay. you didn't, so you failed. Okay, well, we'll get them on there this time around, won't it we? It will be yeah. by the time really? you're hearing this. It really this. will be there. Yeah. If not, well. If not, then, then <laughs> we'll say it again next time. <laughs> no, it will be there. It will be there. Trust me, trust me. Yeah, Thanks for right. listening, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye.